Well, I think the other side of this. That'd be nice. Um, anyone? Uh, we're going to start. Yeah, well, the name, how long you've been here, and um, what attracts you about this vision? This movie, what brought you to this movie? Well, I have my eye on Yeah, keep it quick, guys, so we can introduce each other and kind of get through. Great, Are you here for this? Are you here for the media? Beautiful. Welcome. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for making something awesome. Yeah. systems that make a positive impact besides existing. Um, the meeting that we're having here is to help create a space where interested humans that want to do something positive for the environment, for Tulum specifically, um, and for each other, where they can connect and effectively join forces, exchange contact information, have notes about a topic, ask questions to people who are Taking leadership roles, everyone in this organization is a leader in the sense that it's a self-organizing unit. Um, different ideas, different concepts. At the meeting last uh, yesterday, uh, Raw shared a topic about the streets here. That could become a self-organizing initiative where three people band together to set up a street cleanup once a week, for example. Uh, or Andy, who suggested a, a plastic bottle machine that you put the bottle in and you get the deposit back. Um, requires a series of steps. But we've now created a Google Doc where, where you can look and see, maybe you know contact in the space, um, and you can 
join this group of people working to implement a bottle recycling solution at our um, and so all ideas that can turn from an idea to something tangible that makes a positive effect. And so this is the purpose of these meetings, to take awesome people and their ideas and help execute with it. I just want to say that I'm going to let you Yeah, let's do that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> The reason for the tuning in so everybody gets in the same frequency because we're here to, to have the same purpose. Why don't you guys just close your eyes right now and please keep your eyes. Exhale. Exhale. Inhale, love, kindness, compassion. Exhale, gratitude and forgiveness. Inhale, love, kindness, compassion. Exhale, gratitude. So I want you to ask right now for ego to step aside. Both of your higher self and your being. Bring your masculine and feminine together so we can serve the planet, the people of the area, all the elements of this. Uh, step into the intention of why I'm here, the why. Um, I think the why is to help spread this agenda movement that is proving to be a solution to a lot of the topics of water, energy, food, right, permaculture, I would say is the granddaddy of the agenda process. Um, growing food in a way that leaves the land better than the um, And so this carries to a lot of other verticals that are now happening, like development um, and projects that are integrating different strategies to make a net positive impact, leave the water better, leave the soil better, leave the humans better, that are part of it. Um, um, so with this, welcome guys. Uh, one of the regenerative initiatives, uh, we have a beautiful presentation from our research afternoon. Um, Welcome. Uh, a couple of notes before we start. The first meeting, let me speak this a little bit directly. If you have any questions or comments, please shoot them and let's keep them going every day. The second meeting, uh, I'm not here to preach uh, that I found the Holy Grail. We're all on our journey to find ways of developing better for the purpose of it. So I'm here to learn as much as you are. Why, again, please shoot any questions, any comments, ways in which you think we can do stuff better. It's very easy here. On it. We're as ambitious as we're humble, so we have to learn as well. Let's go. Quick introduction. My name is Gide, 33 years old, I'm Dutch. Um, studying law, figured soon enough, figured it out, figured out soon enough that I was not going to leave my thing. Went to tech startup for many years, uh, working for Lynn Singapore, and Amsterdam. And then, after having a friend in Southern Africa, I figured that my friend was going to leave to uh, Mexico. Um, arrived here five years ago, I guess, like many of you, which is very easy to picture in, in mind. Uh, the beautiful beaches, the blue Congress was passing the, passing the beach road. So, um, from this euphoria, you go into a period of shit, it's also a bit of a mess. It's also a really kind of mess. So, you go into a little bit of a, yeah, this point, let's call it, but then you drop the and say, okay, what can I do to, to contribute to it, to give my version of what I think? Uh, various products, various things should be looking like. We're, we're talking about very big topics here, regenerative, uh, sustainable. Um, how to sustainable? I mean, it's it's it became such a hot mess that nobody really knows what we're talking about anymore at times. I think there's different products for different things. So I'm going to show you two of you, two of them. Right? 
first one, this project I'm working on on the way to uh, about eight kilometers from the Superaki, four kilometers into, uh, into the jungle. There we have a beautiful piece of land, 29 hectares, stunning, stunning cenotes, nobody there, first neighbor, two kilometers away. Um, yeah, monkeys passing by, snakes, shit on the spiders, really jungle. Yes. <laughs> Jaguars passing by every 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 couple of months. It's really, really still alive, which makes very exciting. So what we do there, for people who like to wander off the beaten track, um, we offer a place for exploration, music, art, and wellness. So we host various uh, acoustic concerts inside the gate. They walk down into the cenote, they, they take off their clothes, meet their cell phone for a practice hall, and swim inside the gate where we have various well, we have jazz musicians, uh, flamenco musicians, international, national, a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, and afterwards, we gather. For dinner in the in the free state in Tours, which is a little stroll away from some of it. Um, part of the reason why I want to show you this is why I want to take you on a little more about exercise on, on a few points uh, that have to do with the scale of things and the, and the different products and the different things that we're, that we're doing. Um, a little bit of interior, exterior, yoga, open living rooms. Family rooms, and this is another picture of the inside of the cave where people come swimming in, and then on the outside, the little platform where they can walk out. All kinds of beautiful things. So, that is enough to shame myself, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is obviously a much more, let's call it simply, hippie project. It's a niche, it's a niche market. It's 29 hectares, the land is huge. Ideas to not much more than 5% of the land we have there. Um, so it's a, it's a different market than what I'm currently going to show you how to But that doesn't make this one less interesting for the reasons that I want to mention. First, a little bit who's in the team. Uh, our friends of the Cola Design Office, I think one of the best architecture is Acho de Peru. You find them from the Zine Architectural Digest, both. They're really, really stunding design, always try to take. Uh, Big nature as a part of their, part of their design. Uh, but this being a more residential project, down, we also really want things to work. It's a commercial project we're, we're selling in here. So we contracted one of the most well known supervision companies in, in Mexico, it's called Escala, and they basically do the supervision from engineering, architecture, all the way to construction and delivery on the biggest project you'll find in Mexico. I wouldn't leave them to design a thing because obviously they do the, they supervise the places that you and me mostly don't like to say, but they have a very good understanding of how organization, how infrastructure should be. So that's also part of what we think that sustainability means is not just that it looks nice on the picture and that there's a lot of bumble involved, but that it still keeps on working 50 years from now in the circumstances that we have here. I think so that's that's also a thing that needs to be said. Partnered up the four L and Netherlands with Paul de Kuyper, a friend of mine who, um, who was a director of Regent Villages close to Amsterdam, a 25 hectare neighborhood where they had to completely design regenerative. So they are all their all their cycles of waste, water, energy, food were completely closed. Well, we try to take as much as there's no out in Mexico, but of course it's a it's a that's a big job for the project. So what we could think is no out, and I'll show you a bit about it later. Um, Oh, you can see the guy there in the corner. That's my <laughs> that beautiful handsome young man. That's my my partner in crime. And probably on the left hand side, you might have noticed. Uh, <laughs> this is La Reserva. So what we did here, again, this is a, a residential project. So we bought a, a bought a complete hectare, purposely outside already developed areas. Why? Because we have we want to have all the infrastructure mostly under our own control. Uh, because we wanted to buy a piece of land where we still allow for. Green areas within a commercial project, so the integral is called Um And a couple of a couple of things you, you already noticed. We try to protect as much as possible. Don't go higher than the three levels. Let's say the, the rooftops are, are separated for our left, not for sales, but for rainwater catchment and for the solar plant. Um, the reason this is very important, we'll come back to it later, is from the beginning that we started designing the system account of the where how does the wind flow, how much water is falling, how much rain is falling, the hydrological studies, uh, how do we, what do we do with the water that is falling and make sure it's not flooding and not to be reused, etc. Um, 
How do we eat green areas and all four sides of where the wind comes? Let's say the wind comes mostly from east, east, south, southeast. How do we keep? Uh, and, and as well, the sun fat, as you know, goes from east to the west there. So, how do we keep enough trees on all the sides of the building so you don't receive uh, direct sunlight into your building? What kinds of little twists to make sure that little twists of your past design to make sure that you uh, lose you less energy? So, first one, um, yeah, commercial project feels a little bit icky. Maybe not, but most of you are sitting here. Jungle life are, are, are perceived. Um, but I wanted to pick you on a few uh, on a little bit of thought exercise. Because if you compare the two projects to each other with a lot of tail map, we have an enormous economy of skill that we can use for, for the benefit that we can invest in infrastructure, uh, we can invest in better, more durable materials. Uh, but also, because, because we have a bit of a larger scale, we have access to better providers. If I'm, if, and that's his job mostly. So it's his job to go see Semex, the bad boys of the world, to see what kind of more sustainable product do you deliver. And I'll tell you a bit about it. They actually do have such such things. If I just build a house for myself, they're not even going to pick the phone. Right? And there are many more like that, water and energy and, and waste treatment. So that's a very important one. Also, if you're a little bit smart about where you buy that and how you design your financial model, um, you can allow you have much more room for uh, for this kind of implementation. No? Again, whether it's energy or the problem. Um, and then another, not, not least important one is the central infrastructure. Do you have a grid connection? Um, if there is a surplus in energy, can you share that with your neighbors? Um, if you want to have drinkable water, great. It's kind of nice that if we're relatively close to each other, because if we all live like two hectares away from each other, it's kind of difficult to organize. So there's there's different ways of looking at the scale of, of projects. Um, so the question for us is, well, what is in for leverage care about the project, the product we try to optimize for. What is the thing we want to try to sell? And in our case, it's also a matter of creating a, a blueprint that we can apply on a larger scale. A small house living in the jungle, we can all build. But my, I'm afraid of it, but my idea is that 99% of the world is not gonna lower its qualities of comfort or standards. So the hope is that, but let's compare it to, uh, to storage space. We still need, we, every year we need more storage space, but the storage space, the, the, sort of, the price of the chips will, will, keep, will keep up, hopefully. That's the same, the same hope that we have here. Is technology going to keep up with our comfort levels? At some point, we need to maybe slow our, our rising desires a little bit. Uh, and also make sure that we don't let technology into our house too much, still our house. Right. So, uh, uh, now, the second thing, talking about the skill and nature versus development, um, it's beautiful to have a two-hectare rancho, 50 hectares, and uh, monkeys slithering around. It's, yeah, it's a dream of But at the same time, there's millions of people coming to Peru. Uh, if all those millions of people are going to stay at two hectares each, we also have a bit of an issue. Uh, not only last place on infrastructure, but also on you're touching literally the whole peninsula and you're, you're, you're getting human involved in the whole peninsula instead of a more concentrated uh, area. And I'm not saying I'm a fan of New York high rise, but there is a balance to be found where you still, at this point, what is what is your goal basically? Do you, do you want to separate completely the urban zones from preservation zones? Or do we feel there's a way to merge the two? And then where does the equilibrium, where does the balance lie? Uh, if I live one person on one hectare, are the monkeys still going to swing by next year? Two, four. Then we compare it to New York high rise, where there might not be a single tree anything left. I'm not sure if New York's the best example. I actually never uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but if you take it too far and you end up just with 20, 20 stories high rise, and there's literally no tree around, the effects, long term effects on, on human wellness, of course, are also going to go down. The respect and the appreciation of nature is going to go down all things that I don't think are very uh, very good for the long run. And if you look sadly at a lot of designs, Google Future City, you're going to find a lot of designs which I think, geez, it would have been nice to leave a couple of those trees around. Them. So I think most of what I want to say is there is a product for different things. We we are looking to design a place that becomes a blueprint for something that is applied applicable on the market scale. So that we can not only do here but in other parts of the world. And then it becomes so almost yeah, very scientific question. 
where they'll be for living life. Leaving everything as green as it is and having active like this space, but then also then becoming luxury or getting it a little bit more concentrated, getting it certain efficiencies and still try to maintain your connection with nature. Good. Anything you want, anything to add something intelligent about it. Good. So all we try to do within our little hectare, I guess not a sense of sort of time, exactly. But a healthy and inspiring lifestyle within the most sustainable environment that we can. So first a little bit of uh, food with not pictures of the design. Um, a couple of things, of course, I should do what's beautiful here. Uh for the ceiling windows, so we got a good connection to the outdoor. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the, the specifics of the, of the design of installations and equipment. I said, Cola, the award winning architect that we work with, very good friends. And uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here. She's pregnant, so I don't even want her to be here. Uh, How many units on the property? So there's 42 units on the property, <laughs> and one hectare. And this is the central garden with the fire pit, the pool, the real pool, and an organic restaurant in the back, probably for the entrance. And then in the back, there's three palapas, and we can find for yoga meditation. One we want to design as a bit of working library kind of uh, one. And then the last one for our phone. Here, one very important thing that people don't really take into consideration when the buyer is looking around, there's trees everywhere, palm trees, beautiful. I want to buy the place. Hey, wait a second, next year the neighbors are still. Where are those? <laughs> So that's one thing that we want to take into consideration. So from your what we go to public street, that's 12 meters between the two buildings, which has 45 meters. So that's a little bit of whatever window you look out for to look at trees. You need to be able to undress yourself in the middle of your living room and not have the idea that that's 20 people watching you. So unless that's your thing, and you're over very <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. The trucks on those that last slide, if you go back, is it are those trucks gas or electric? Um, <laughs> I would say they're gas. Yeah, I'm pushing back. You're not trying to be with me. Yeah, are, is, are, is like building an ecosystem of like electric vehicles? Because you talked about space and so forth. Is that in storage? For, for electric scooters, yeah. We're planning on storages where people can connect their scooters in, inside the storage and then plug inside the storage. Uh, what people do on their vehicles, on the current infrastructure of the loom, I, I mean, I've seen Tesla, Tesla charges connected to diesel generators. That makes me cringe a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> So we left it. We we haven't included any any electrical vehicle charging points, but you know, honestly, we could, and it, it wouldn't even be that difficult to to, uh, to add it. So no, no taking. Yeah. Another question when you were doing the last slide of uh, the kind of development of nature. Um, no. Uh, was, yeah. So I'm curious, what was the permitting process that you went through here? Partially because you know I have a piece of land kind of close to that, and I'm just. Curious that the municipality here, did they, did you have to go through environmental regulations, et cetera? And whatever you can share about, like, what was your process and, like, how tall can the building be? I heard it's by the highest tree, you know, for example. So, what, what was your. See, you're looking at me. Is he going to tell a real story? Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you need to uh, take your own little compass more than anything. You've got this. No, I shouldn't say this on camera. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad to tell you anything off camera on how it really went. Um, I'm not going to tell you a rainbow sunshine, sunshine, sunshine show. But you literally, if you want to build a casino here, you can build a casino here. Uh, it's not what we wanted to do. Um, that's okay. Okay. Uh, to anybody who really. Put, put it this way it's not that linear. It's not. Right. You're not going to go there. It's not there is It's not an explanation. Write the book over the wall. No. If you build that, this is that, this is essential. There is no book. So you will have to write, and uh, they are not going to provide you enough information for you to assess different options. And that's the tricky part. You're like, well, I need to understand my business model, and they don't provide you enough information. So you have to come with a proposal, and usually that proposal is kind of last. Okay. So the negotiation and the process is, uh, is a bit tricky, but obviously there are a lot of, uh, of regulations that are attached, and the most difficult one is for me. Uh, and I can tell you about this moment. Okay, okay. Basically, you have a lot of rules that are not about the municipality, but more about the, 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 the okay. state. Okay. <coughs> yeah. 
They are coming for treatment man and they are the group and they will uh, they will close your working system if you don't follow it. Okay. Because they do not relate to the music Thank you. But I think you want to yeah, it's a couple more. Uh, there's a little bit of the outside part of it's always we don't sell stones anymore, but we sell a lifestyle. It's very cliche, but it's obviously true. We we really started thinking, okay, if I want to wake up in the morning, uh, what kind of comfort do I want to have? What kind of food do I want to eat? What kind of exercise do I want to do? If I want to swim, what kind of food do I want to swim? That's if you look at the loom market, and I just saw very few things that I would really want to live or uh, yeah, or buy part of. So the running trail, the outside body weight exercise is going to be all around the property. It's currently in construction, by the way, so it's not done yet. That's why you see the renders. Um, but say July, August next year, then uh, we're going to bring the first phase. High season, if we don't go well, then we have the, the first showroom uh, left. The, first, the lobby and the restaurant will be ready. The restaurant will open to the public as well, so we have a bit of a function for the rest of the week. I have a few questions. Yeah. But, um, so in the last development meeting, we discussed a few main points that we would like to cover for each of the developments. Yeah. Um, I'd like to share a few with you, maybe the yeah. presentation. Yeah, I'll share the screen to them, all the installations and equipment. Okay. okay. Yeah, maybe afterwards I'll question them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's do it a little bit of design. Alex. 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 Some coming in from this side, so we're part of the bottom set of CS on the first level. Uh, I don't believe it's going to come back. Is there, a, is there a bedroom? Yeah, so three. you have your, your bed here, you walk up, and then you go. Right. Actually, three bedrooms. Yeah. In that, that's not like a window. Yeah. Is what they have a window all of that, or is going to be a window? And uh, no, these are windows. <laughs> so the, the bedrooms and the, the rooftops are, are behind there. This is a bit of a mess that you can turn into the Uh, yeah, so 
But we currently have plans on the top of the on the top of the restaurant. We will have a, a composting system, a closed composting system, where everything is that what you're referring to with biomass or are you talking this one? Yeah, but also your your trees for landscaping and even for winter months, you know, inspired so we're going to have balloons and trees and stuff like that. Uh, in general, we'll whatever organic waste areas, whatever organic mass. Uh, well, let's start by the organic uh, waste of the, of the residences. So they can be taken to the restaurant where we put them into a closed compost sink and we try to turn them into uh, biogas and into fertilizer. Fertilizer going into the garden, biogas can be used in the, in the communal restaurant. So that's a little bit of the field. We separate spaces where we can, we reserve spaces where we can separate the waste. So you can bring your aluminum, you take plastic, and from there we take, uh, we can coordinate with, let's say, the, the municipal cycle when it can be ready to come together. Yeah, I said, so some comes up here, some goes down there. That's the important part. Try to leave trees on all, on all four sides. Where trees are not high, you're thick enough with bamboo set of CS. So despite the, despite the sun hitting, you say that means a 50% of the heating of your apartment. Um, and now, forgive me for becoming a little bit geeky. Uh, I'll skip this one for a second and come back to it. So on the, on the water, the more interesting stuff. So the idea is, and it's really expensive. The idea is to have the whole uh, the whole development will have osmosis, reverse osmosis. So everybody will have drinking water from the tap. No more carrying around garaponas. Not wasting half your living room on, on five garaponas because you're not going to walk every day to the garaponas to have a little bit come back with garaponas and empty again. Um, so drinking water. Um, that's a real that's a real investment. More so because legally, and you know about it better than I do. Legally here, you need to. Get your water from your source 45 meters deep at least. That's not what most people do. They just get it from six, seven meters deep because there's already water. And it's easier to treat because it's not yet as, uh, as, as, as salt and hard minerals. So we go 45 meters deep so we don't subtract it from the uh, from the highest stuff of the, where the trees are still drinking from. Uh, currently, the drinkable water, rainwater catchment on all the third level roofs, uh, the wastewater treatment plant that gets back to a level that we're still in consideration. It was not a joke that I just said it. Between an anaerobic and an aerobic system. Um, uh, the idea of obviously is to get it back to a level where we can use it in all the gardens again. And part of our definition of sustainability is also resilience. Uh, the loop is not an easy place, not only because of the elements, but also because of the existing infrastructure. Um, so we plan for a system now of four days of a four day backup of drinking water. So whatever happens in the power outage, in a storm, or whatever. We have a backup generator to power the pumps, and we have four days of drinking water for all the for all the residents. That's it's nice, but it's actually kind of a must. Yeah. Okay. Energy wise, so we have about eight hundred square meters left for a new solar plant that will be discounted from from residents. It's, uh, basically, they can get a large share of their energy consumption from renewable energy. Um, if you go that route, you also need to take that into account in your design. So all the windows are energy saving windows. If they go into a new factor of 0.28, which is the most energy efficient that we can find in the Mexican market currently. And tell you a bit later about the energy saving features. So we have a special kind of centralized air conditioning system. It has a it's not a completely intelligent home because we didn't really want to go that way, but it has a thermostat that notices if you're not in the house after half an hour it will shut off or it will go to an eco mode. If you leave your windows open, it will notice, shut off, turn into unique mode. So also, you rent your place out to visitor, whatever. They go to the beach, leave it on 16 degrees, they cannot, because it will switch up again. They see, okay, 20 minutes later, nobody in the home can switch up again. Those are the, 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 the things that we want to think about. Construction blocks, uh, share a few images of that as well. We are using for the for the walls that are most exposed to the sun that we have modeled in, in SketchUp. Uh, we've used a German technology called Able. Able. I guess. Uh, <laughs> they are perfectly and acoustically superior to the normal building blocks. I'll show that a bit later. And also with regard to energy, so we have a, a battery backup system of four to six hours. So, whatever power outage happens, your Wi Fi, your ventilators, your electricity power outlets, they still keep on working. Your AC, obviously, not because that would, be a, that would require almost another hectare of battery powering up just at least so you get the regular stuff going and flowing while you wait out. Or see if you can such it. Air conditioning, sorry, it's really becoming a bit technical. Maybe yeah. I want them to forget it. Um, we went for a centralized system because all these, what we learned from 
Escala, so the vision company has all these ugly, horrible, huge resorts on the on the way through here. That might not be the place we want to stay. But in infrastructure, they are oftentimes a step ahead because the guy that builds those places is mostly the guy that's going to operate it or at least pay for the operation. So I'm not saying they're all they're all perfect, but many of them need at least for financial reasons to think about their operation and how to lower their operation cost. So that's where we got on track of the mini chiller, which is a centralized air conditioning system. It doesn't use free of gas, uh, it uses 30%, up to 30% less energy. Um, you're not gonna see this ugly white plug. Sorry, you're just gonna <laughs> you're just gonna see a solid line in the roof where the where the cold air is coming from, and it allows for all these tricks to okay shut off if people are out of the house, but think about the things are open, etc. And these again are advantages that come with scale. So if you build one single house, it just would be ridiculously expensive to install those. And this is also where I think developers can take a little bit of responsibility because for Jalil and me, there's no difference in putting it. Like I put a mini split and I would sell the same part because everybody's energy consumption would go through the roof and you'd pay an enormous amount of energy bills. But for us, there's personally no difference. So that's where I guess everybody needs to take a little bit of responsibility and say, I'll do the extra investment for the long run. Um, ah, just actually, actually, the composting on top of the restaurant. We uh, we're planning a little work on the farm. At least you get people. I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna produce food for uh, forty two apartments here, obviously. But at least you get people back into the into uh, cultivating their own food, seeing where your food comes from, being able to bring your organic waste to the same side. So you start to understand or to not educate, but show people a little bit of the, that cycle. So. Oof, tough one. How am, I, how am I going to explain this one? Um, very briefly, energy is here produced by either four plants in the peninsula or single cycle gas plant. There's one like a combined cycle gas turbine, but most of it is pretty inefficiently produced. To then bring that energy from either plant or carbon or by the all the way here over this over the cracky post on the, the the thin cables all the way to region 15 is not the most efficient way of transporting energy and make producing or transporting energy. And to then in your living room turn it into heat. To either uh, either do gas cooking or, or your hot shower, it didn't seem to us like the most efficient way of currently doing things. Plus, if you're really a cook and you like to cook, no one really likes to cook on a game board, so that's why why we went for gas in the last plate also. Then I'm resilient. I want to be able to cook when there is a storm, when the power is out, and there's another outage. I want to be able to have a hot shower. Those are the kinds of comforts that we can permit ourselves. So it's a it's a bit of a give and take. Um, in all honesty, that is as scientific as it gets, but it's very difficult to get to the real 0.00 percentages of CO2 emissions and what are their emissions. How do I compare a CO2 emission versus taking natural resources out of the out of ground? It becomes a very tricky um, decision, but mostly for the resilience, we decided to work together. Um, you know, the hidden ones that we spoke about. It's also a question of process, like what were what were the tricky things during the design process and during the building process? Well, the Hamel is one of them. Forgive me of the ugly image, but these are the ones that are going in like, between supervisors and architects and what's that book and whatnot. Um, these are all the walls that are being done with the Hamel block. They, these are most exposed to the sun. Um, but then you figure out these blocks are expensive. So you want to do the right thing, but you also need to fit within a commercial project with all the other features that we already offer. So then you go into this is one of the difficulties where you need to liaise between architecture, supervision, quoting with builders coming back, engineering, do the whole route again to figure out your real cost. And then you figure out, wait a second, I'm having endless the all the white walls are I'm having endless walls, and then I'm never gonna see the sun. So then you go back to engineering. You go, you go back to your architecture, you go back to supervision, you go back to quoting. And that's how you, that's one of the optimization processes where we are going to build all of this of this block. Yeah, beautiful. But at some point, you need to find it. Excuse me. Yeah. Do you use tools like, uh, like ProCore to manage or Matterport to manage like your, to see your workflow and how things are progressing like day to day, week to week on the site? Uh, no. I no. Yeah. Well, me personally, I don't. I don't know if the supervisors or either the architect use it, but I, I personally don't use it. I need to stay a little bit away from the sign, otherwise, you get so involved with everybody turns right. Um, um, yeah, here's another one. Oh, sorry, there's still 
heard about the Texas Sun here. Presentation made in a rush, you know, um, one of the other good things about having a bit of a little bit of a larger scale is the threat of uh, concrete of Semex. Yeah, that's a big company, uh, and yeah, that's concrete, but it's uh, the very best option that is scalable on, on a global scale. I am excited by doing the, the low carbon the, for net zero concrete. That's the product they don't sell yet in Mexico, but what they do offer here is a, is a version where there's 30% CO2 emission less. So what do they do? They went and do their ovens because the base products, the resources that go into making concrete are not the ones that are very harmful. It's mostly the process by which it's made, the ovens in which it needs to be heated, the temperatures that need to be reached to make concrete that are the most polluting and the most well, CO2 emitting the um, So what did they do? They went to do their, 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 ordinance, their oven systems and tried to lower as much as possible without sacrificing quality of the product using alternative um, Alternative energy sources actually picking up uh, old truck tires or old car tires, bio biomass to, to heat up their, uh, their ovens. So, those are interesting things if you operate on a little bit of a large scale. Uh, <coughs> pictures. Last picture, perhaps. Interesting to close up with. Yeah, just to close up and to repeat what I said before. So, seeing that many people will not necessarily, the majority of people lying there will not necessarily lower their, their comfort levels. So, what can we do to make technology catch up without making technology too far, too big a part of our lives, um, without losing eye for nature, without losing contact with nature, but still remain on this, on this comfort level? So that's where we're working on this blueprint. Uh, we're looking on next part, for next project also on the other side of, of Mexico, but uh, Portugal as well. Um, but the main focus is here to do the to do the first version as good as we can and to keep on iterating and to keep on improving on the design that we currently have. I think that's uh, just about it. Thank you. Thank you. How do you process wastewater? Wastewater, a five-stage uh, five system, which will be either anaerobic or aerobic. Uh, uh, that makes it so part of the diet, biodigester, part of the oxygenation, part of the, 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 the fat traps, um, part of the UV treatment. The, the, quality, the quality level that we try to reach is to be able to use it in the garden again. So not, not to be able to grow crops, because that would be another another method, another objective, but at least so we can use it in the automatic sprinkler system again. And then our surplus, if we can disattach it, we can put it back into the ground without it being harmful. That's cool. Um, so, one other question what percentage of the land is going to grow? So, currently, the footprint of the apartment is a little bit over 20% of the apartment itself. The apartments. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said 42 units. Yeah. What's the capacity of people? Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's an average of 100, let's say around 160. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. 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 How many toilets are we talking about? Toilets? Yeah, number of toilets. Well, so we, after the last development, we we, a lot of us have been sharing points that we all think are very valid. We <laughs> went like this off last time and uh, asked some very like points like this, pretty much. I took these mostly from him and from other suggestions. Um, so it's kind of a rubric we're setting up yeah. so we can have all the developers that are going to continue to present, like easy to kind of navigate through and see what it is. Yeah. So thank you for mentioning these questions. Yeah. Toilets, toilets, there's two or three toilets in the gym. Yeah, I can look up the exact okay. number of what it is. Uh, but, yeah, um, for waste management, do you guys have like a recycling plan? Do you guys have a, I, I heard the organic waste management. Organic will be, solids? Yeah, organic will be created on site. Uh, solids will be separated on site. So it will be organized for pickup either through the municipal plans or organizations on our side. Uh, Are you working with any specific recycling center? Or no, currently, a, currently not. Like it's where certain development is not. Um, there has been a couple of there have been a couple of initiatives, not all of them very consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, I recall one of the that passed by at least our condo 
but that, that was sort of a charity I recall, and it's sort of kind of in a community. So that's still a topic that we really need to investigate at a time. We at least we design spaces to, to be able to separate it and clean it and leave it there. Oh, wow. And from there on, we need to, we need to want to organize it. But at least now there are beautiful pickup points, there are beautiful collection points in Madrid on the other side of Tumaca, I believe. So that's that's a huge step forward. Yeah, that's yeah. I think that this is going to sound maybe a little bit snobbish, but I think it does help. Is not for people currently buying arts, we want to stay there for a longer period of time, so it's not going to be 100%. Okay, obviously, it's not going to be that much focus on holiday right now. But still, we will have our fixed scheme of, of maintenance and of cleaning. So, I think there lies it. Yeah, we'd love to educate people. Uh, and there is ways to incentivize them. Every time you drop something, you get a, every time you drop off a, a bag, whatever, you get a, a drink there, or you get a whatever there, or a discount on your, on your bill there. So, there is ways to incentivize it. But I think more than anything, you would have to train your team to, to, to do it. So. Sometimes the design is here, no, but they can be talking for them. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's going to be a tough one between execution and, a, and an operation. It's going to yeah. be. A, but then again, the, the kitchen should all have space to have it already implemented in the kitchen. So, I mean, if you come to a place where you open the closets and the drawers, and there's one for glass, one for plastic, one for et cetera, et cetera, and you still put it in one bag, you know, that's something that's going to be very simple. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit where I wanted to go with 
how to what extent are people willing to lower their comfort levels or or their I don't know, their what they're accustomed to? Like how, how many of you, for example, really live in the jungle or what they consider jungle? Right now, no, I used to live in the jungle. Yeah, yeah, yeah I and mean, out of the no grid power, no cell phone reception, no. That, that's what I mean. So I'm not fighting you. I don't get me wrong. I hear your argument, and I wish that we have good for fucking years to find a better solution. And every uh, regularly, still alternatives come up. Adobe is not really the not really the solution here either. Um, stone is beautiful, but that is artisanal work. I mean, I built I built stone walls. Part of the place in the jungle has a beautiful huge stone walls. Uh, that stone, that wall by itself takes as much time to build as the whole as the whole lot of effort and all those things that you have here. So I wish there was a better alternative. And the net zero is not yet there. And I hear you. Part of the net zero is bullshit because they can lower their ovens to a certain standard. Fine. And you wonder why didn't you do that before? Why are you now upselling me right. uh, more expensive concrete while you could just lower the right? And then the other part is because the last let's say forty percent. They're still truck going to the place to bring you the material. They're still not in burning. So what are they doing? They are upsetting it. And then it becomes almost a philosophical question. Do you allow, do you find that net zero yes or no? I don't because yeah, that's not net zero in my group. So that's also we have the ambition to try to become net zero, but even there within something that seems so unambiguous as net zero. It's pretty darn difficult too. But what is net zero? Us having six meter high but beautiful glass windows? Is that that's still net zero? You see, so that's that's a difficult because that's the commercial philosophical position that we take on a daily basis. And uh, if anybody had a better a better alternative, I would love to jump on it. And it needs to be commercial available here. Because there is there is concrete where they sequestered CO2 conventional concrete, there are different forms of fly edge concrete that are being made in the US. I've done a little bit of research, but there is on a more commercial level, there is not too much available. Or there's concrete of course Any clay? Clay. Yeah. On the property itself, no, I think that's one of the downsides of this this whole region is that it you're straight on rock. I, I sometimes look at a tree and how did you do it to, to go 12 meters up? It's just like spreading your, there's no clay, there's no clay. Yeah. Deeper in the job, I think um, within a group of people are farming, there's more clay for sure. I see a bit of that on the, the other part of as well, there's more clay to work with it more ghetto. Rain is very We try to gather it to be different. Two questions and I hope I'm saying it's all enough to everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hope I didn't miss it during your presentation. This was amazing. As I wish the part of the sewer system in regards to the toilets. I wonder how is that uh, well, that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're going to basically go to the, to the same five stage uh, treatment plant, and then the end of the treatment plant, we, we, we want to reach the same good enough quality to be able to use it in the garden itself. From your toilet it goes into the treatment plant five stages. I know anaerobic or aerobic, we're still deciding on the topic. It has to do with uh, maintenance costs, has to do with smell, has to do with noise, has to do with technology. Um, and then the quality of the water should be good enough to not break it or not put it on the rocks, but at least use it in the garden. And the scooping water, uh, there's a there's fat traps. So before any big before any big plant, there will be fat traps. Uh, any any big large kitchen restaurant will have a, a grease trap or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So the second, the question is, according to the rules, your garlic like the targets. The targets. Uh, most of them are people, or actually all of them are people that, that have to know to look that have to look more often and are looking for something that really works. It's, it's a high end product, but something that is visually pleasing and also, yeah, takes the boxes when it comes to sustainability, to the lifestyle. Um, let's say it would be hot. 
you know, forty percent American, thirty percent European, twenty percent Mexican. But almost exclusively people that say, okay, I want to spend five months a year there, six months a year there. I'm not the silly person at all. I, would, I, I really didn't even want to do it. But a lot of good, fun people that know Bloom that want to live here, that want to spend time here. So. And the price tag for these plans would be higher because the concept of the other concept or is the price tag higher? We try to make things better with other high end developers. We do think that we want Any questions left on this one? Um, all right, we're going to segue to the next uh, speaker. It's going to be Francis. She's going to share about Regen B. Uh, Francis has uh, joined Regen's room and been very enthusiastic about moving back here and uh, taking a step in organizing more events, more presentations, and uh, ideas. Um, we're going to be passing around a QR code that we can just scan it and check in. Um, I'll be passing these meeting notes uh, via whatever you share with us, email or WhatsApp, or share a link to where the notes are. Um, how's everyone feeling? How's everyone going? Yeah, I'm also going to be passing that scan first. So first I'm going to go a little bit into the importance of green building certification. 
expectations and why they add value, why it's added value, not, not just because the, you know, you're looking for the trend, you're looking for, you know, you want to be following yourself sustainable. No. Um, first of all, they encourage men uh, mandate safety in the construction sites. So you have to have certain safety measures within the construction site. Material sourcing is another route. Which is important to look at because the majority of the population are looking at building a project. They're looking at the project of they're building it, they're selling it, and they're done with and off to the next one. You're really, when you're thinking green and you're thinking sustainability, you have to look at the actual lifestyle of the entire life cycle of the entire property, right? So the med maintenance costs are going to be lower in the long run. It's all going to be, it really adds value to the consumer. But depending on the developer's mindset, you know, they can take that into consideration or not and just look at the quick and sour eye. Uh, corporate social responsibility, environmental social governance requirements, which is now a very big thing because there's funds, there's companies that are actually required to invest in green building. They're actually required to invest in green projects, if you will. You're going to have to increase capital value, higher resale value, and I'll get a little bit further into that later on. Um, Risk mitigation, climate change is real, climate change is happening. There's a lot going on right now. You see what it's here. If your property is future proof, then you're gonna you're gonna be less like less you're gonna get less results than that. So again, future proofing uh, your body's longevity. So right now, if you're buying into a sustainable development, that I think they need to look out for looking at an investment. You can you might be paid. That property is just going to be out. There's over, since I moved here, there's over about 200 projects that were registered with Tulu Company, probably Association of Realtors here. Now there's supposed to be over 600. Practically none of them are sustainable. Um, you can buy it to any of them and look at that, but the ones that are going to retain their value is going to be the ones that are actually. Okay. All of these They rent faster, uh, there's a higher rate for the rental, and there's a higher occupancy rate for the commercial properties. That's actually a very big thing right now. We have um, further, we're working with International Living Future Institute, and Salesforce, Google, they're all getting the Living Future certified. Um, and it's work, it's uh, projects that are actually built for their for, for their employees. Then your carbon footprint reduction is going to save our planet's limited resources. Limited, I stress on that. And you're going to help countries achieve carbon payments on goals while ensuring environmentally responsible construction. And it's aligned, this is just a little bit of a graphic to give you an idea of how we build the world we build in council is aligned with the sustainable development goals. So it's going to go into all of these uh, different areas, including people's health and well being, renewable energy. You can use the renewable energy, which are cheaper, green infrastructure, creating new jobs, and building the economy. Um, we're building with the science for innovation and the Jewish and weather resilient infrastructure. Um, they're sustainable um, for community and facilities. They use circular principles. These are just the basics of, as to why finance will be built and sustainable development. This is based. This is just, this is based because related for projects that are actually looking to get finance. Um, and I'll go into my next presentation talking a little bit about green finance. And there's trillions and trillions of dollars out there for projects that want to build a green land. So um, this is actually the potential for green buildings. It's estimated at 20 billion by 2030. Um, 15.7 billion for being on residential. Right now there's not a lot going on residential. Most of the green buildings that you see is sort of like buildings are on the commercial side properties. Um, and now there's kind of a push over to residential dollars and all of that. And the projection rate is 14.3% CHDR, so uh, Now, going into some examples of green building certifications, EDGE is one of the, um, I would say it's one of the easiest, but it's not easy at all, because I don't think any of them are easy. If you look into it, it's more resource-based. Uh, 
Um, so it's available at about 175 Your project has to achieve about 20% reduction in water materials. That's the actual standard for uh, the debt purification. Um, it's a cloud-based cloud platform um, that is going to calculate the cost of both green and utility savings throughout the process of it. So basically, how much extra it costs to go green? It'll calculate that. There's a software that's created for all of this. You have to plug it in, you have to go back and forth with your, with your team and tell your architect and tell your engineers, okay, this is not working, this is still not working, you're plugging in information into the software to be able to get that. Um, how much time it takes to actually charge the money back to potential operational service? Savings throughout the uh, life cycle, life cycle of the project type. Um, it will calculate body energy in the materials. So, not just you know, throughout the process of the materials extraction and transportation. <laughs> and we will provide advanced systems to provide advanced projections on carbon emissions for assets and portfolios. We're looking for financing, refinance, and so on. Lead, lead is actually one of the most well, it's one of the better known uh, rebuilding certifications. It's going to cover uh, the integrity process, it's going to cover the location and transportation, sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, um, indoor environmental quality, innovation, and regular clarity. Um, now, in this one, you have to, it's sort of a point based system. So you have to you have to score at least 40 in uh, in all the data that you're obtaining throughout any of these areas, energy, water, waste, transportation, and human experience. And there's different grading levels: building and design, interior design, building operations, or neighborhood development. And lead is a super popular. I mean, it's actually sort of a standard that you can. It's a public place, so you basically have the standard, and you take it anywhere, and it's a checklist that you have to meet. Whether the place is able to meet those or not, but it's really that in consideration, which is the difference with international living design. It actually analyzes the location, uh, the community around it. What, how do you expand on that potential? That's why that is one thing that we tend to work with. Am I going too fast? Living buildings actually. You're aiming the highest one, you're aiming for net positive in water, net positive in energy, uh, and body carbon. They're looking at it. Um, and I'll, I'll move into living building real quick, but um, well, there we go. So, this is the difference with living building challenge. And you have different levels of certifications that you can go into with the International Living Future Institute. Um, first, it's really important to take into consideration where you're going. You don't, you know, the your building here is not the same as building in the, in the United States, it's not the same as building anywhere else. So the first thing that an international living future team does is go into the place and evaluate the area. It takes a while to really do the research, do, you have to do the study, find out what the actual um, characteristics of the location is, so that you can actually base your certification on that specifically. Um, that's, that's one of the aspects of it. So it's going to consider regional factors specific to the place, community, and culture. Not just the actual geographical area, but the actual community. What can you do to help the community that's around you? How can you bring the community into the project? Like we have a project that's certified in New Zealand, uh, the Maori tribe were the ones that actually built it. And it was sort of a quest for them, but the documentary on it. It's, it's amazing to watch. Um, we did it we had it at a conference, so I can actually share with we we get to read the, the link for it. Then um, compliance is actually based on actual performance. That's also a big difference. A lot of the rebuild certifications, like Edge, for example, you can get sort of a free certification, a lead, you can you can get all these certifications before while you're in the design stages. If you're checking, if you're meeting the checklist. With International Future Institute, your building or your project has to be operational for one year before it actually gets the certification. So you can hit all the checkpoints, you can get free finance for it. But there's an auditing team going on continuously, making sure that your project is actually meeting the standards. So at the end of that year, then you get certified. So it's actually based on true or fact. Um, so all of the you know, living building challenge projects, they're, uh, they have to be holistic. It's an integrated process where um, one thing that I've learning 
what we can be in. I'm, I'm no expert at all. For me, it's just like it's been a learning process. I'm very blessed to work with an amazing team um, and amazing CEO of we can be that I work with. Is that it cannot, your team has to be very united. So you can't have the engineering, the architect, and I'm doing my job right. And, you know, it's pointing at each other. No, you all have to be aligned as to where you're going, what the direction of your project is. What you're aiming for, and understand that there's going to be challenges, there's going to be difficulties, but you have to collaborate and you have to help each other. So that's it's sort of it's it's an integrative, a holistic process that is kind of different than most projects. Like this came from working on a project in Bayer for a little bit, and I noticed the interaction with the engineers and architects, and I was like, we're so disconnected from each other. If, if that's not that, you can't have that with facilitation. Um, so you're going to have to cover these imperatives: it's place, water, and Health and happiness, materials, equity, and beauty. Um, so there are three typologies that are going to be different. It depends on what you're looking at. You can look at a new building, you can look at an entire new building, you can look at an existing building, you can look at the interiors, you can look at the landscape or infrastructure. I love the fact that it looks at existing buildings. And, um, as much as I love new buildings, I and I love development, I really want to focus more on you know, when you're going on land, you're having to put your time on land, you just don't have copies of land. We don't have the ability to continue to destroy the forest and build anymore because our planet is just doesn't cannot afford it anymore. So there's about 80% um, of buildings that are retro that need to be retrofit um, in the next couple coming years, between now and 2030, and 20% is going to be new construction this worldwide. So we can go in with existing buildings and we can retrofit them, which will mean you look at Challenge. Well, that's, that's one of the best things. Sorry, sorry, Francis. Retrofit. Retrofit. Okay. Retrofit. So, I retrofit is to basically you take this the building and you are going to retrofit, take all the original systems out, you're going to put a new system. It's like a remodel, but for energy to meet the actual to meet the actual certification. There's a project called the Loom House. I'll send it to you. That was really building certified in Canada and it was a complete retrofit. So it just gives you a little bit of a matrix of what you're looking at in each of the imperatives for the living building challenge. Place, um, you're looking at every single one of these things. So you can call it your place, urban agriculture, habitat exchange, human scale living, responsible water use, net positive water, energy, environment production, net positive energy, healthy interior environment, healthy interior performance, access to nature, materials. Materials is um, it's a difficult one, it's been, especially in Latin America. Actually, in the US, you have um, you have actual labels that tell you what the kind of materials have in Latin America. There's real manufacturers that don't really know how toxic the materials are. It's one of the things that we're working on with Region B. We're working on a mining materials database where we can source local materials and plug them into this database so that architects and engineers that are looking to build green, they just go into that database and say, okay, this material is going to prove green. I'll go into that a little bit further. So there's a red list materials uh, that, that means those are materials that cannot be used. They have some, they have toxic uh, materials in them. They have toxic chemicals in them that cannot be used. Responsible sourcing, living economy sourcing, that positive waste. And then you go to equity and beauty, which is universal access to pollution, beauty and biophilia, education and inspiration. That goes into more the community aspects of the And these are all, if, you, if anybody wants to get more information, uh, the future, uh, Living dash future.com. There's uh, you can download a lot of information. Um, then ILF focuses on you have zero carbon, which is performance based. This is the only performance based standard, carbon standard that addresses both operational and embodied carbon. Because most of these organizations are going to address operational, but this one actually addresses embodied carbon. It's the only standard that's going to measure actual decarbonization, not just reward but, uh, carbon calculations. Uh, there's no combustion, also renewables, and it's future proof and post carbon building market. And zero energy. This is one of the best in class of energy efficiency. So you were here looking at being at about 40%, uh, and then here you're looking at about 60 to 90 percent over baseline. Now, uh, energy efficiency education for occupants. So that's education is a big part of the future too. Any project that's actually being built with um, IL5 generally has an educational component to the community that's around it. So they're, they're, they're educating the people that are around it so that why is this building a living building, if you will? Like, the then this is actually the most difficult of the uh, living future 
So in this building, that you, every building that I've shown you is actually certified. There's no need to stand certified. This building you know, was built in New Zealand. It's the one that they have a documentary on. And uh, it was sort of a statement, if you will, for a trial that the Crown came back their land to that they wanted to build a uh, testament to New Zealand, the Maori, New Zealand Maori tribe. It's particularly why it's the name of the building. And it's a big building. All of the materials have to be locally sourced. And there's a wonderful documentary that tells you what the challenge was of getting to the building. Um, as far as the community, if you're looking at building an entire community, and this is the most difficult, difficult one to get at because you're not just looking at the buildings, you're looking at the entire community connection. Um, the community is connected by the forest ecosystem. It, it has to be healthy for all elements of life. Well-being is taken into consideration. Um, it ha it, it's nurtured. It's going to be nurturing and generous places that promote healthy lifestyle for our journey. Net positive with respect to everything. All of the materials that are used are multi purpose. Um, so they're reused over and over. And you can come in and you know, there's, there's buildings that are made from materials that have been salvaged. Um, there's regenerative spaces for people in natural ecosystems. And then there's places that are walkable, walkable, and they have more cross public transportation. So there's sort of the least spaces for living in the community challenge. Then I'm not going to get too much into it because I want to go into the region B, but there's other different aspects that living in the future to go into, which is transparency labels for materials. Um, so you have just, you have declare, you have reveal. We work with actually getting materials certified for all of these. And I say, when I say we work, I say region B works. I work with the experts. I'm not the technical person, I just source the projects. <laughs> Again, going into going into some we have our set of going into other building certifications. You have reset air quality standard, reset Costa Rica standard, the Cream, the Cream Globes, International World Building Institute, and there's a number of other ones with different standards. Here, um, Bloom to Bloom is recertified in Edge. Uh, it's, Edge is again, like I said, resource based, but they have a huge footprint on the land. 777 is Seeking Edge as well. And when I say pre certified, they don't actually have certification yet. There's a portion of those pre certified. And then La Reserva, which you just heard about, seeking that cereal, one of my favorite, if not my um, ultimate favorite, anyways, I think like I said, they're doing the best job here. So, just to kind of give you an idea of how few products there are here, then you have ones that are land based. Who are the projects that you are seeking? Seeking. So, you know, so they are uh, they're not already not certified. Pre certification for blue, so they have a pre certification, but they they have a model home, but there's no cert, not that I know of, no certified bodies here yet. But there are they are some of the ones. So um, you cannot get through a single day without having an attack of the world around you. And I look at this whole what what you what you makes a difference and what you have to do what you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Um, I look at this quote as something for the consumer. When you're going to go buy you know, into a project, are you going to buy into a project that's going to be sustainable or not? You're going to make an effort to actually that decision, that purchasing decision is huge. So, how is that going to impact the planet and the world we're living in? How is that going to impact the children or grandchildren? Um, so, I really love that quote. So, that's um, a bit about the green building certification. We're going to jump into right away on the finance of the UK. that was a two point So, um, yes, real quick, how long is this presentation? Um, um, would you want to do another meeting, maybe? You want to do it right now? So to tell you a little bit about who we are at uh, Region B. So essentially who we are is, is, is I work with uh, the head office, if you will, that we're a consortium of both different companies and uh, it's Regenerative Built Environment Institute. We're a collaborative uh, of different organizations that are working together to really help expand the regenerative movement. Specifically, mainly we're focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but we do work internationally. We are very, very close with international ways to choice in Europe, um, in, uh, in, in the Middle East as well. So these are all the these are all the these are all the organizations that we have alliances with. Um, as you can see, we 
Venice International Teachers Group. Mindful Materials, um, just so you're aware, we're officially the only Latin American hub for the Mindful Materials database. It's, a, it's the largest database on materials so you can go into and find out if those materials are already vetted, what's, you know, whether they're sustainable or not. Um, and if anybody, any questions that you have, I can send more information about all of it, the website, et cetera. Uh, a little bit about Victor. Uh, Victor Montero, who is the CEO at BJP, he's the person that I work with. He's been working on sustainable development since 1992. Um, and he's been he with the National Living Future Institute Hero. Uh, so he's been working with the with the actual um, certification for many, many years. Uh, he's been he's, he works out of Costa Rica, Costa Rica base, and he's been leading this and general built environment institute collaboration throughout. Um, he's, he started a sustainability program for the University of Costa Rica back in 1996. Um, he's certified lead, which he's an auditor, he's a consultant, he's a general practitioner with the Genesis Institute, um, and he also is uh, an expert in reset, uh, reset certification. He's sort of my, my, he's my mentor, if you will. He's the person that I work with on a daily basis. So, Region B. We are, the way that we look at things is that sustainability is just not an option. This is just the ethical baseline that we need, we need to look at. We need to look at be looking at that as a baseline and then moving into regeneration when we look at projects. Very difficult, but that's that's what it should be at. Um, so this is where, this is what a traditional, traditional uh, project is going to look like where we're at. So your conventional practice of building right now is going to be right right at the bottom. It's basically complaint, compliant. So it needs code, it's everything needs everything, but it's still negative. Then you're going to have green, which is relative improvements. You're going to go into sustainable. Then you're going to be going to restoring uh, the area, doing certain things to nature, regulatory. Then you're, you're reintegrating humans and nature, and then you're going into regenerative, which is going to design. You're going to design a project with participation of nature and the climate as well. And then involve all the other aspects that before. Um, so these are this is what we're aiming for, and uh, I'm going to talk about quantum leap. We're looking for a quantum leap because right now we're very very low, and it, it it's required that we really take a leap, and we have to move fast because we've wasted a lot of time in the past years building in a non non sustainable <laughs> So that's where our image for the quantum leap: an abrupt change, surge, or dramatic advance, and that's what we see that. At the um, General Growth Environment Institute. So these, this slide is going to tell you a little bit about the different certifications. I'm not going to go too much into that, but you can find them on the website. And you can go from the lowest one up until the highest one, which is what they call the challenge that I spoke to you about a little bit a while ago. And then let's go into green finance. So one of the things that we do at Region B is we assist developments, um, municipalities, projects, landowners that want they don't have the, either they don't have the money to finance their project, but they want to build it, they want to build a truly sustainable project, or they actually um, are aiming for that. They need to do it for corporate responsibility, whatever the reason may be. But we can actually help them source that source that funding for that. We have a lawyer that is an expert. She was a legal counsel to the Global Climate Fund. For several years, so we work with um, designing your project according to the needs, that, so that you can meet certification and meet uh, what's needed to actually be able to access this, this, this green bonds. What are green bonds? It's a debt instrument that capital is going to be obtained uh, to finance either a green project. There's different ones: there's green bonds, sustainable bonds, and social bonds. Um, and, it's, and it has to comply with the uh, standard emissions for the uh, green bonds that. Have the National South Exchange. Um, and again, it can be issued by governments, financial institutions, it really depends on. We actually help you with uh, obtaining that. We already have an agreement with Costa Rica Stock Exchange, Mexican Stock Exchange, several banks. So we can, there's several countries that we're already set up in to do this. There's others that we are in the process of working with. So this is going to go into a little bit about what is a green project. Um, it's going to be one that is going to generate several environmental benefits. I think everybody might be a little bit aware of what that is. Again, they cover energy efficiency, renewable energy, transport, contamination, 
protection, natural resource management, conservation of biodiversity, sustainable modern water management, and other. Um, we are working right now in potential bias in Tulum. We are looking at potentially sourcing new finance and really providing here in Tulum. Um, it's been a little bit of a difficult process and a long one because we are in Tulum, we're in Mexico, but we are we are trying to do that for, for the area. We are some on uh, some that are going to be more at the municipal level and more on others that are more on private level. Then you have social bonds again, same same definition that you can be used for this in some different areas. So these are going to be focused more on basic infrastructure, like drinking water, sewage, sanitation, very necessary here in the area and everywhere, health, education, um, compliance, and vulnerable groups, um, affordable housing. And uh, yeah, so they're, they're interrelated. And then you have know, sustainable bonds, which are just a combination of both of these. So this pretty much just combines both of them. And that's why we like International Agriculture Institute certification because it's a combination of both. If you're focusing on the infrastructure, you're focusing on the actual building part of it, but you're also focusing on the community side of it as well. So it really merged what marriage as well to be able to get access to this new finance. This is actually a little bit of a, uh, how, how the finance has come in uh, when you design the project. So this is a traditional project you design differently. You're going to go into the um, early area of the project in front end, and you're looking at um, this is an what they call an exploratory design process. It's an iterative process. So one of the differences with the International Literature Institute is that every team, every project that's being worked on in different parts of the world, there's a forum where designers and practitioners are comparing or sharing information with each other. So it's a constant iterative process. It's a living certification, if you will, where you're actually um, sharing information with somebody that's living in New Zealand, somebody that's living in Tulum, um, and you're seeing everything that's happening in one area is cross pollinating information here, which doesn't necessarily happen. It doesn't happen at all, actually, with the other certifications. So it's an iterative process there. Um, this is sort of the different um, components that are that go into the design process of a project when we, when we become involved with it, and we're able, we we're able to get the finance for it. So that's um, pretty much it for this one. It's a short presentation. Uh, any questions that I can answer for you at the moment? Yeah. 
30 right now. Yeah. Um, again, there, there is a, there's a project that they're working on. There's several projects that actually are being worked on in Mexico, but you won't see them as case studies. And there are actually projects here that have been built according to specifications, but they haven't actually decided to pay for certification. So we, I actually work with architects that have done that. Um, we are in the process of working with some developers here that are aiming for living future certification. How it works is, like I said, every place is different. So you, you have to have, we have to evaluate the location itself and the certification is, bit, is given based on the conditions of that specific location. It's difficult. It's a challenge. It's a challenge, but it's a challenge that's needed. That's sort of the way I see it. I mean, I, but everybody that I work with is aware of it. We're aware of how difficult it is, but it, it can be done. It's not impossible. It has been done. Um, in Costa Rica, we're working on several projects. Here in Mexico, we're working on several projects. Um, I know of several of a number of them because I'm involved in a chat um, in the So um, I look at it as, as the future tool. So, yeah. Thank you for asking. Gracias. All right, guys. So, um, without further ado, Karuna is going to share um, about his project, uh, Water Now, and um, water topics here in the area and his specialty. Thank you. Well. Uh, does anyone have a little connector to go from a uh, not not the USB C one to a uh, HDMI thing? Any chance, huh? No, another one. HDMI to USB C? Is that what? Or, or, or no? Can I ask you to hold this um, super high? Are you recording? Is it right now? Oh, okay. Again, we need it's hold it for I Okay, let's ask. Questions and topics, and we would like to bring up or set up about the questions about how to involved in the Is there a holder for this? Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, well, so water, guys. Um, water is one of the main topics here in Tulum, to be honest. Uh, there's very little infrastructure, and the infrastructure that does exist is uh, partially not working. The water treatment stations are not working. This is one of the first main campaigns that Regent Tulum, as a group and as a unit, is working to make an, make an impact on by preparing a letter to the president about the urge and the need to focus on the water treatment systems here in Tulum. Uh, we're signing up businesses and signing a petition to present this letter with a little bit of uh, more impact to the president. So if anyone's interested in supporting with that, talk to this doctor. Uh, Kuna, go ahead. Thank you, doctor. And uh, thank you to the and um, Francis also for the presentation. It's very heartwarming to hear uh, about the you know, push for our public service to care of this. Mm -hmm. Helping the ecosystem. So, my name is Kuluga. Uh, I am the CEO of Ornell and the Walking Tool Food Bank here. Uh, kind of our projects and how uh, we're uh, planning to support the situation here in Tulum. Thank you. 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 You know, we focus on certain different things, but one of the main ones are filtration systems. Reusability, we collect a lot of great water recycling, rainwater catchment, construction water units. And basically, our aim is to raise the water quality, minimize waste water, and help in the process save businesses money on the operation of each building. Our ultimate goal is to be scalable, impactful, environmental sustainability, and all the water. Um, so I'm an environmentalist here at Northwest University and FIU. And um, really quick background, I kind of climbed the corporate ladder for about 17 years. And then um, about seven years ago, I started realizing that I was working for a real estate water company and they sold two thirds of California's water, but California was still in drought. And that they were charging a lot of money for water and the water had a lot of so I really, at the same time, started going to more ceremonial type things, um, peyote, ayahuasca ceremonies, etc. And my mind shifted. My mind shifted, and I said, you know what? I want to be on the side of nature and history, but we're going to be positive for the planet. So I left corporate America. I started my own company, um, and now I've been around for five years. So that's a little bit of how I, how I got to, to this point here. Um, since then, I traveled the country. Started my uh, uh, talking to water now. Just uh, this year, we hit 100,000 people, reduced the purified water, uh, finished 236 products already, 235 environmental permits, and we've been in 12 countries. Most of those countries are in Central and South America, um, between here and Brazil, and Colombia. And I'll share more about some of that work in those different countries. Um, let's see here. So, look at that. I want to, I'm going to go global, but first I want to talk also about some of the local things. So we all love to live in the weather for the meter, you know, um, it's really a little paradise. But we have some major issues here that we all talk about, and some people know, and some people don't know. Um, and some of those are that basically all of the moon right now doesn't have any central wastewater system. Um, it's been a lot of development, not much regulation. Um, Basically, the waste uh, is generally leaking to the aqueducts, which, as the name is there's a lower aqueduct, which is very shallow here, so it gets three or four meters. And then there's lower aqueducts, which are really lower groundwater. And right now, a lot of the leachates are coming into the upper aquifers. You know, it's a, it's a combined socioeconomic position. Um, I started going down the rabbit hole of why this happened. And, um, Honestly, it was kind of like for me to have a rough of the pandemic, why it's happened. And I decided to like focus my energy on the solutions. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, you know, I think the action is needed. We all agree um, because if not, they can't go on like this for too long. Um, just to know things like being contaminated is very not great. Um, there is in general, you know, at mid year, I'm always unfounded by the lack of monitoring construction. Like, how can there be a billion dollars of hotels? So, and no drainage at all, no sidewalk, no, no, not a road, not even a piece of road. It's not even that expensive, these roads, you know. Um, but 
anyway, so you know, one thing that's been exposed lately is that we out of the floor, we have been online, offline for a year or more. Um, there's a video that went viral showing people picking up wastewater and basically dumping it in the jungle, um, which is a huge problem because um, the latest estimate is that 50 to 80 percent of the offices are already polluted. So I say we already passed the tipping point or something like that. And the water quality in Mexico is one of the poorest in the whole world. As a matter of fact, it has the highest per capita plastic water bottles in the whole world. The only one that uses more plastic water bottles in Mexico is India. That's what they have at one point. So, um, also the drinking water notoriously has super high levels of glucolide, very high levels of harm water. Uh, the hard water is from uh, our sleep coming from the cenotes. Uh, how we the reform, rather, the rainwater is left crystalline and rocky material here. It forms really with a lot of calcium, magnesium, um, a lot of other things that contribute to hard water besides. A lot of the hard water issues are, are natural because here, and you can find natural water, salt water, and it's issues for that, even you know, for showering, a lot of people, especially when they're they can feel the difference in the hard water. Um, other issues uh, are trash, recycling, compost, and jungle parties and drugs. I don't think that you know, I didn't put this on here for drugs to be the problem themselves. The problem is that a lot of drugs are uh, in the water system because people flush them on the toilets, and a lot of they just mention a bunch of cenotes and they have fish mineral water. So that's the issues we're facing collectively here. I'm going to jump right into what I consider to be some of the wastewater treatment options. You know, uh, I worked in New Mexico and also in California um, with large wastewater treatment plants that serve whole cities, including Albuquerque, Santa Cruz, and a couple other ones. Um, you know, basically, you flush the toilet and everything connects to the sewer system, it's set up to the largest treatment wastewater system, and then they treat that way. Um, I put the pros here as being an efficient treatment, meaning that it works in general, um, you know, uh, but it does have the cons that it's very expensive to do. A lot of cities spend millions and millions of dollars doing it, use a lot of energy. Uh, I guess there was a tool that are, it takes quite so much energy to waste and to connect to get from it. Being in day, they use a lot of money to treat the water. And it's hard to retrofit, meaning that the loom right now is infrastructure. Uh, if it doesn't have a ready essential wastewater treatment plant, it's almost impossible to get one going down at this stage because of the way that we have to done it if we need to all this heat the pool, put in huge mains, put in plants. I think part of it now would be um, to move Pueblo is that um, we're looking for ways to treat waste on site. Um, and when you're going to retrofit a system, what you really have to do is size it and plan it from the beginning. Otherwise, the infrastructure is just going to come, come in for tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but they do have, you know, the waste work from the plants here. And it gets a little bit of something back in line. And um, I want to talk about some of the other possible green uses of waste. One of them is biodigestors. We have to set up a system here uh, in Cape Plus One. Some of you might know that it's up in the north of Mexico City, just south of Mexico City, rather. And we did an eco village there where we helped to produce energy for them. And basically, it's biogas. What we have is an inlet there, and it's supposed to be anaerobic there, and it's going to treat it. Um, and we had a settlement area. And what's basically going to do is the ground. So we have a flush that comes in. The inlet in the pipe there, it comes here. This method produces the actual gas that can be used in treatments uh, and in, um, in for energy and electricity. And then we have an outlet there where um, also you can actually pump this through garbage and things like this. Um, it's a very good system, actually. Um, you know, it works well, it provides energy. It's one of the pros. Um, the town is that this town is set up. You can, you can, it's been hard to do it yourself, and it's more for smaller applications. In other words, that it's not typically used for large developments. It's not typically used for whole cities, because it's more of an on-point uh, solution. Humidors, um, 
which are waste water through plant filter. Uh, and, and generally, what this is going is you set up a series of plants that um, the waste will go through, and you can set this up at your, you know, at a home or apartment. I think one of the last people we saw, uh, except the realtor go back and was doing this. Relatively inexpensive to use, you sell natural materials. Um, some of the cons is it can still produce some smell, and it can be affected more in residential areas and commercial areas than a lot of the Dry toilets. Uh, safe water is really one of the biggest things. I guess the biggest actual waste of water actually comes from toilet flushing. Flush is about 15 liters per flush, which means you're basically flushing a guy with all of water down every time you flush a toilet. In the States, it's mandatory to have low flush toilets here. Some we have here, some we don't. Uh, you know, some people do the, like, you know, if it's yellow, let it mellow. But anyways, <laughs> you know, brown flush it down. But I feel it's safe a lot of water. Um, ponds that have you know some smell, comfort, hygiene. I think in the jungle where they dry toes are good for me. I live in the jungle also. Um, for me, I can I can deal with it. Um, but a lot of Western people they want to have a type of flush. Um, one thing I'm going to talk about now is bioenzymes. I think it's an incredible technology. Um, for disclosure purposes, I am a distributor and on the board of directors for Dr. Bella. They're also on my board of directors for what now. The founder, Yoni and uh, Eric Cardo are from Israel. They bought this um, they bought this to California about three to four years ago. Um, it's used locally already, Coco Village, Sonara Hotel, the real coconut using this product. Um, it's effective, it's economic, it's ease of treatment usage. The, the downside to this is that you need to have an existing septic tank or major septic holding tank to basically be able to use this treatment. Um, which means that you flush a toilet and it goes to the one or more holding tanks. It could be one of the separate solids, another one could be another holding tank. But you have a holding tank on site. The one at Coco Village, where I live, is with the apartments, and they have two large holding tanks. The beauty about this product is that. Um, it's super effective. It comes in a one gallon container, uh, it's two, uh, 3.78 liters, and um, it basically breaks down all the removes all the ammonia nitrates, reduces the EVs, phosphate levels, metabolism, the, all the organic solids and sludge, reduces precipitate water. It can also be used in, um, uh, as fertilizer. And it helps to liquefy sludge for those crisis situations. So basically, it's a it's a non-GMO natural microorganisms that are have each each amount of milliliters has millions millions of bacteria that help to break down all the shit. And so, we find it's amazing they use this at Boom Festival, and the last one I was at was 2018, um, and they had 50,000 porta potties there at Boom. And they use this for the first time there in Portugal, and um, none of the porta potty smells at all. Um, because basically, what it does is it goes in and it starts to rapidly deteriorate all of all the all of the things in there to be toxic. And it does it in fast time, like one or two weeks. One or two weeks. Which they've used it now, especially in California. They just used it for a hog farm. I have a little video of that on some slide. The hog farm produces the fecal matter of the hog is one of the most toxic ones on the earth in terms of the number of bacteria and things that are considered toxic. They take it to the top of people plants and things. They put this product in, they dump like the whole thing in there, and the water was actually starting to clear up within a matter of a month there. And so they used to, they used to have to get people that come in full body suits and masks to come and take this toxic waste over out and now they're able to apply this. Um, Basically, what you do is in a holding tank, you put in a certain amount for how many thousands of gallons you have, and the inside treatment does the rest of the work. So, now I'm going to shift the focus a little bit and um, talk a little bit about some of the weather products here in Mexico. Um, in California, I got uh, certified for ARCSA, which is the American Association of Rainwater Catchment. And basically, you know, rainwater, I would say, is probably the most under 
underutilized you know resource that we have because it ranges abundantly, especially in like numbers and things like this. And what generally happens is you have non-pervious um, material such as uh, concrete and stuff like that. The water isn't going to percolate into um, the ground. A lot of it is the traditional sewer systems. Here you don't have that much rain and stuff, but basically once rainwater goes through a natural process of cleaning the earth, then a lot of times it's not used for anything except for, for like the central trees. But if it falls in city zones, it's not for anything. So we're doing a project now in Los Angeles and a couple other places where basically we're installing rainwater on top of large developments that are already pre-existing. Um, rainwater catchment can help reduce the usage of water by 50 to 90 percent, which means you can own pretty much live with rainwater. Yeah, I mean if Sorry, it sounds like a big high-rise project and they like water up, but it's going to make sense to use the toilet uh, and the ground. Yeah. So the toilet's like left and down the Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think that here, for example, you can see the rainwater coming from there. Um, with some of these self-contained systems, you can pretty much use all rainwater. You can use it for the, the toilet, flushing. We use it for laundry. Um, you can use it for gardening. You can use it for irrigation. You can use it for drinking. Like in LA, we didn't use it for drinking without uh, filtering it because it's no acid rain. So they have some pollution in it. But here in Tulum, for example, we tested the rainwater. The company here called Cloud Hot. Did they? Um, they also have uh, used rainwater. And in general, um, rainwater has really good quality. Etc. Here in Tulum, it's good water. The only thing is that we're very close to the beach in some places, so sometimes there's a high salt and mineral content in the water. Um, but um, so I put here that, uh, and this is I'm trying to convert this from my from you know American to Tulum beach school. So um, one inch of rain, two point five centimeters, and a thousand square foot house, and it's going to be a better like a thousand gallons of rainwater, uh, which is you know 2400 liters or so, um, from one inch of rain. So, one inch of rain, you're talking about that much rain on the roof, you can live for a week, you know, it can collect and uh, for, for the house for larger developments, it can be even more. Um, so I encourage all developments now when it comes to you possibly to use rainwater as much as possible. California was illegal until only three years ago, which is incredible considering California's been in drought for the past five years. Uh, Florida, it's still illegal, where a lot of my family is in Miami. So, Catch the rainwater is illegal. I say the only reason is because they wanted to hook up the utility system <laughs> and they forced the deal on the grid. And, and then the statements are two, three, four hundred dollars a month sometimes for connecting to the municipal water system. So, they're forcing the the pipe to water, essentially. Yeah, yeah. But no, but just one more question regarding the, 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 the two parts you mentioned in California. Is there no other sort of ecological reason for it? I don't think you guys have enough to come from wondering if there's no, but it sounds too ridiculous to be true. Is, is there no other rationale behind it for anything? Yeah, but I, I studied that pretty rather. So, so, no, it's a good question. Definitely a good question. Um, and I asked it a lot of times. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I did it um, basically uh, from the authorities in California at the time, and it didn't make it legal now. But at the time, the argument was that you can't regulate the quality or the standard of the water. And California is also one of the most regulated states, over regulated states, like besides New York. But besides that, um, they said that for municipal, like if I have a home, and let's say if I live in LA, I can't drain water, if you want to drink it, if you want to get sick. And then they would say, you can come and blame. LA for getting sick with the rainwater. That was kind of the rationale so they don't have quality control over it. They kind of wanted to be behind it. Um, meanwhile, Nestle had a solo contract where they're pumping four trillion gallons of water out of the California aqueduct every year. That was okay. You know, so I was just like, you know, but the, the reasons they gave were safe public safety and and uh, not being able to control also the distribution of they thought that people would start selling the rainwater. Yeah. I would say here in Mexico, sometimes 
here. You know, the systems that I had last time, the, the larger RO system, um, the technology got a lot better on the use now. Uh, you get 200,000 liters per day of oil on the use. They remove all chemicals, bacteria, and minerals. And that's not a typo. They actually remove all the minerals. Also. That's why we don't install any of these uh, unless we have to. And have to means there's a big enough place where there's not that much other options. With other filtration units, they start to become limited to their capacity and size, and that's an issue. What we usually do here is a remineralization if we need it, and there's a lot of different ways of matching for a bit of um, the water. And basically, what the RO membranes do is they'll also can remove some salination, but they'll take out pretty much everything from the water, do some packing it through this RO process, and then local example is the pipe line or something. They're pretty much with the dampener RO system. Yeah. Where are the manufacturers? The, right now, the um, the last the big blue ones they mostly were manufactured out of Colorado and California, but now there's we started working with distributor in Mexico City. So yeah, so now we're getting a lot, you know, less shipping costs because they're always taxed. Of course. Oh, I mean, I mean the filtration department. Uh -huh. Where are they manufactured? The, the last one they showed. Yeah. Those still manufactured in California, but now there's a manufacturing plant in Mexico City. And same with these, these are, these are also manufactured um, out of the space, but now they have uh, one hand. It's actually a place in Medida now that we're using this warehouse. Yeah. We're saying technology improves a lot in one sense, and we don't regret the wiring that For the ROs? Yeah, because they're still energy bills for the, for the big wire that we are insane though. The technologies improve mostly because they used to waste 40 to 50% of the water that actually went through the RO systems. Yeah. If we're treating 100,000 gallons of water, they would actually lose half of that water. The primary thing that you produce, you lose another you lose, you lose like half of your water. You lose it, it becomes so heavy, so heavy mineral that you have to discard it. It's basically a waste of water. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. It really becomes a waste of water. Exactly. Yeah, so what's the benefit with the wastewater? And is with the better technology, is that wastewater or less wastewater? Does it mean by all of your efficiency or? So now the, some of the better technology, the membranes have gotten there without getting too much into technical details. The membranes allow for less waste of water now, less energy input than previous generations of NARO. And now people with <coughs> estimates are down to 10 to 25% of waste for the newer systems. But there's still a lot of older systems on the market that are like kind of the last generation of ones. So they're basically reducing the amount of waste water that you can use. Some like you have something and you have this other Wastewater that's coming out, well, what can you do with it? Yeah. Um, we've done some similar rainwater recycling things for a lot of the super high minerals. Some of it can still just go back to the earth, be used for certain things like irrigation, etc. cetera. Um, we usually test it and see what is like the uh, product of it, you know? A lot of times, too, the DARO is going to put out water that has super high um, contaminants in it, so because you basically put them out there. so. Yeah, and you can also be filter some of the wastewater again too. Um, and we put in a UV, for example, in some of the wastewater, and we're able to make it a lot more usable for like rainwater systems. So, those sort of feed the plants into those little ponds that are more resistant to salt water, and they kind of pump three, one glass, those kind of things. Yeah. They got the water in school. Yeah, actually, that's a great point. Like some plants and uh, I guess species, trees, et cetera, they need a certain kind of water. Maybe it's alkaline.
I'm going to go up and do this kind of briefly here. These are the inputs we use, like the last thing, how I know what kind of filter to get. Uh, we'll move on to the by bit for these different hotels or places. And we add that we basically ask people a lot of water we need per hour a day, your water source, um, your water test quality. You'd be shocked to know that out of 10 hotels I asked, nine out of 10 of them, the sustainability manager does not know their water source or what more they use or their water quality. Like these are these are the people that are running the hotel. They just don't know. They don't know what the system is. They don't know the quality. They have never got it tested before. How is that possible? Yeah. I heard there is a place that I'll get opened up that will be close by here on uh, the ICFA tour uh, area. And they test for E. coli and other things. They don't do super advanced testing where it's going to really test a lot of limits and stuff and what's in the water. But they actually have opened up now as of just like a month or two ago. Before we were having to get a lot of samples shipped off to Cancun. Inset is one of those networks. Inset. Are they level up there? Uh, they are in two I don't think they have an office in La Veleta. Yeah. But basically, they, they do operate. In I think that's the same one. That, that one. Um, so you're trying to get the quality of the, the water here is going to get um, the size number of the outlet pipes, pressure, um, water storage size. I think you mentioned your presentation here. Um, Quick story here, I was really encouraging people in California to get water storage. Uh, in general, they say that each family probably should have about you know, 10,000 liters of water storage, or enough for usually about one week, you know. But anyways, two years ago, three years ago, the fires came through California. They burned down about 20% of the county when I was in, including a lot of the cannabis farms I was consulting for. And one woman, she called me and she goes, you know, we just put in 10,000 gallons of storage for our farm. And the firefighters came there. Our farm was about to get burned down. They tapped into the storage tank. They put the fire out for us and our neighbors. And we still had drinking water for three or four more days. She said, You saved my life. But because I told her, You have to get water storage here. And so that, that really, I think like everyone should have water storage. You can get water Basically, they um, found out we only take 
five months to do that. We put in a large growth assistance for them. Um, our project was twenty thousand dollars for their for like a set of uh, five or six different Pokemon for each building. Um, but they were using they have hundred rooms Pokemon. Is. They were using one hundred fifty thousand plastic water bottles per year. And I went to the rooms and actually saw them. And there's little small plastic water bottles. And they put two per room, or two per room, four per room. They put them every day. So they're putting a ton of money on it. So we're saving them a million pesos a year just on their plastic water bottles. Um, and their maintenance required only 500 feet per building, 1,000 bucks. So, you know, we calculated over 15, 20 years, we're going to save them 37 million pesos. And we would say, like, oh, it's an expensive system. It's not that expensive. So, so the redevelopment that we did for a five condo unit here, it was about 3,000 bucks. This is a developer that's coming that we're going to do the system beforehand. Um, and, you know, before they're going to get our worst osmosis for each separate unit, which is about $1,000 per unit. With everything else, it's going to be about $6,000. This is about $3,000 for the system, for a commercial system. So we kind of, so they're saving about 50% of the money um, from installing it beforehand. So that Talk a little bit now about big picture. You know, an indigenous woman once told me, she said, you know, people think that the water is created all the time and everything, but it's actually a fact there's no new water that has been created over the past. Since the earth was started 4.5 billion years ago, they say the first evidence of water is 3.8 billion years ago, and that there's no water ever really lost in the whole global water cycle. It does go through these processes where you have, uh, you know, Runoff and rain condensation, and then it goes to the subsurface flow, runoff and evaporates transpiration. The issue is not the amount of water on the earth, it's now how much water we can Because once the water goes down through these aquifers and gets down here and goes back to the system, it's harder and harder for the water to purify itself, basically. Uh, three quarters of the earth to the oceans. Uh, so if you're 100 years of the life of the water molecule, 97 years would be the water in the ocean, another 2% would be ice, um, about you know, but the 1% is there, and 0.65% of the total water on Earth, just over half 1% is actually fresh, drinkable water. So that is one important to the, the aquifer because these rivers, lakes, streams, and marshes are only less than 1% of the water. Um, I want to do structured water. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, I hear you right. You said less than two percent of three foot water on, on the planet, less than one percent, zero point six five percent. Um, and now they say that's much less on the whole world, they have about half the whole border. Of the whole world. Yeah. And, 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 and if I understood you correctly, that is caused by what by, by the pollution, the percentage. This is the less than 1% is just the, the, the water on the earth. Like 97% of all the water on the earth is just, it's just in the ocean. And then another 2% or so is in the ice. And then that only leaves about 1% or so, which is in condensation in the atmosphere. And then half of the percent is just what we can break and what we're sitting around. What percent of that is contaminated by humans? About 50% now. So less than a half percent is actually. Here drinking water. It's about 0.33% of the water on the And I would assume that most of that is up at a higher uh, altitude. A lot of it is in the mountainous areas, you know, a lot of rivers, a lot of lakes. Here, you also have, you know, that also includes aquifer, like, you know, Tulum and in in this area, New Japan has the, the largest underground river aqueduct system, you know, in the world. Um, and, but we don't have much running water. There's not much above ground uh, running water, but they do have the snow base, for example. Um, but the mountains, in generally, like here, will reduce a lot of the runoff that's actually being used for, you know, it goes down into the water. Um, you know, I studied with uh, my guy, Dr. Hoto, uh, about uh, seven million years ago in Miami, and uh, he was teaching about structured water. And what he was saying was that. Uh, if you go to the highest place where work has been touched, it's coming down there. If you measure the energetics of it, that water 
we discovered was about 3,000 times more potent than water that comes through pipes. And um, they say that water that comes through modern infrastructure, the reason is because water um, always goes in curves in nature. So like, you know, rivers are flowing, all this water is usually moving, not in right angles. Also, the organs in our body where the water moves through, since we're, you know, whatever it is, uh, 70 to 99% water, um, there's no right angles in our body either. So, when I went to engineering school, they say, okay, if you're going to build a line from here to there, you have to build it all right angles. You build a 90 degree bend, a straight line, and then you put a 90 degree bend there, you put another straight line. Another one, the average time the water hits the, your tap water, it's not through seven to nine right angles. Water loses 50% of its energy every right angle. So by the time the water gets to you, it's officially dead water. Meaning it has highly energetic energy levels. They say it's like traveling with a family. Each time you get a fork in the road, half the family has to swim out. And so that's what water goes to on top of the you know, shit on and on top of the, all the chemicals that it's on. By the time they say the water gets back to the state there, it's basically destructive, meaning that the molecules are hot mess. They're you know, discombobulated, the molecules. And that's what most people drink. Uh, you will drink. Most people are drinking dead water. This water. Is the, what is considered dead water? What is dead water? Dead water basically has no mineral content, and it's a very low energetic level. Um, it's been shocked multiple, multiple times by chemicals or other processes that your body can't really absorb the energy of the water. So it doesn't have barely keeping you hydrated. You can taste the difference in a lot of the waters here. This lost its um, we call it insulation. But, um, you know, this is part of what we're doing with the experiments there. And I guess they took two different molecules and one molecule of water, they said, like, I love you, thank you. The other molecule, they said, you're, you're an idiot and um, I don't care, ignore me. <laughs> And that's what the picture of the water molecule looks like that they said you're an idiot to. And that's the one the picture that they meant that the water said, I thank you and I love you. They've also done some more ones around uh, frequency, um, frequency vibration. So I guess water essentially is one of the most sensitive elements in the whole world, it is the most sensitive to energetics, energetics, frequency. And they're just now starting to realize that. Um, there was a lake that he wants to went to with a bunch of people. It was in Japan. And they all came and they prayed. They told our Lord, I love you. Thank you. I'm so happy in life. They measured the water before and after. It came completely directable in a matter of days with them praying every single morning. So if I understand you correctly, then anyone can do that. Yeah, that's, that's true. That, and that's what we to call the water response. Uh, so what are what the what these units do? We have uh, like some different kind of units that we do. But what these units do is all they do is they put the water in what's called a double vortex technology. And it sounds complicated, but really it's just the water spinning and vibrating. And like imagine like the shape of a tornado and it's going different directions. Um, putting what's this water has the most ancient memory? Just putting water back into its anything you do with water, it's going to remember right away. So just putting it back into a certain motion. Is going to remember it from before. And by the way, water levels start to really spike whenever it gets to either an energy, uh, a vibration, a frequency, or a movement. Um, so here's some of the structure benefits. It's like it's been relatively scientifically proven that water is more structured, maximizes hydration, immune system, increases your nutrients, your oxygen levels, electrolytes, cellular hydration. Increasing detoxification, blood flow, face that digestion, softening skin. Um, you know, a lot of the water now that's coming through all the traditional Western systems. You know, I don't want to call it a conspiracy theory, but you know, the water is getting people with fluoride and all kind of stuff that is not really helpful to the people's water is provided. Even in most of the plastic water bottle companies, I would say my friend Miguel has worked at a company out of Ziba, and they mineralized water, it's sky off. We've tested all the other data points here. 
and they're very acidic. And we went from Bikura to Bona Fonte to all the other ones. We went to 5.5 and 6.2. They have heavy metals in them, they have fluorine, they have fluorine in them. They're basically like the whole bottle of water. So uh -huh. I don't recommend it. Sure. Yeah. So uh, not to debate this fact, but to ask the question, I'm familiar with your local studies, but they're and they're substantial, which I support, and so does quantum physics. If that is the case, and what should we be concentrating on educating people towards their self empowerment and self building of water rather than building filters? I think both, honestly, because you know, I tell people this sometimes, um, and I agree with you, what you're saying is that, but like when I was traveling in India, for example. And I had a glass of water, and I know this water has a lot of bacteria and parasites. If you drink it, you're going to get really, really sick. And I did. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to drink this water and try and restructure it myself. And I drank it. I think I'm, I know I did a ceremony. I think I'm a pretty good like, spiritual person. I drank the water after doing that, and I got sick as shit. Maybe I'm not spiritually powerful enough. <laughs> yeah. So, technology is like anything, it has its part and things. You know, I say, if it's already spring water, I feel a lot better praying about it. <laughs> you know, you know, if I know some like shit, the water comes from the Ganga River and I'm a bitch drink it. So I well, would I say would certainly bathe in the Ganges after the or brush my feet. Yeah. And they do it every day. So exactly. It's like they say, like trust in Allah, but tie up the camel. So uh, yeah. Uh it's a little bit here. They measured a bunch of fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and stuff. I didn't put it on here, but the, the cannabis plant is like 32.5 or something like that. Uh, here's a nice little light from um, I think the Kachaba group on that right here. And, uh, the border structure supports life on the earth, the border is healthy and complex structure, able to communicate information, very healthy movement, promote healing, self cleansing, and destructive ways. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of water technology just still coming out right now. Um, so, the, the universal communication ability with water. So they can retain it as a kind of life sustaining energy and information, uh, and how it's vital to all the systems on the planet. Two years ago, I spoke before Paul Stamets at a vision festival, and uh, he talked about the mycelial network. How uh, the mycelium are able to be the worldwide web, so to speak, and connect all the trees and the trees and talk also. And one of the ways they can do this is yet that water is able to go down into the networks to help the water to communicate. So the water basically inside of us can communicate with all the other water around. So, so I'm gonna close now um, soon about some of the, the projects we've done. Um we kind of some examples here. Here's a few of the ones that we've done here. We've done we've worked with two different facilities on Amiatana, Lava Letta, we did one where uh, actually close by here by Lysica. The Paul Hotel, and now we're working with some Mayan villages in Brazil. Uh, <coughs> uh, we're working now with Rock and Rock and Rock and some other ones there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Jungle Project, working with Hotel Bardo, Treehouse, and then Habitat's Hotel now, so it's all systems for them. Uh, these are our the projects. Here is some of what we're doing at um, Lama to Lama Satya, uh, the only neighbor bear with me. We have 50 hectares total of a 350 hectare of development. And, um, is this the space you have? Yeah, this is the space I have with Eli, who's been here before. He had the other 300 or something hectares, and uh, we have 50. <laughs> but um, I'm personally doing a treehouse community. Um, I did a work on Bali a few years ago. And uh, I'm going to build a community of bamboo tree houses, hopefully. And uh, we've already got design points on and stuff like that. Um, there is a bamboo farm close by here. And we and basically tend to be a regenerative community um, and, and be operated in terms of solar, wastewater, water, public interest, and natural materials. I plan to personally use hemp free to uh, get some exported, imported from California. I'm also going to try some cocoa free. So 
How are people, how are people buying into this? Is um, I bought it last year uh, about uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah. But how? It's just on a like a use contract. Or like, yeah, it's basically um, a partially communal structure, but it's not like um, everyone's sharing everything. Um, it's also like they have the central part where it has like, parks, etc., road, etc., Sinope, and then there's um, everyone kind of builds on their own too. And we just have sustainability principles that might get into it. Um, How many lots you see? Yeah, there's 50, uh, 50 lot each one, but more than one. Of one heck of Yes, that was everyone. Yeah, they fell out more than one. Yeah, yeah. And where is this located? Fell out more than twelve. Also, the road that I have to touch. Yeah. Come on, the size of that tree house. This is a cob that I built with this guy in California. His name is Sir Cobbalot. Miguel Elliott, and he built a cob structure. So, cob is pretty resistant to all temperatures, hot, cold. In the heat, it can keep you cool. In the cold, it keeps you warm. Um, so I'm planning to build kind of a model of different sustainable homes and then see, see, um, and then kind of have that be attraction. I think that Adobe is basically just water, um, clay, um, and dirt or hay and uh, earth, dirt basically. So it's kind of like an earth home. Here's some of the products we've done. Uh, that's done in the past five years in California. That's Stanley Rock. We built a bunch of water filters. So we're going to the Amazon and then the different folks there. We're going to go to Bali. We're going to go to Bacalar, Bulgaria, Native American communities in Navajo, we went to Egypt, and we did a project at that in Mary. Brazil, we just have to build a 70 hectare eco village for Guyana uh, that was done last year. And uh, then it's coming now with the Elsie Bobo and the Amazon. So it's a little bit of a challenge. Let me show you one more thing about the projects here. I just want to link to our to our to video that I have just about this and it's called Bali. Um so I'm going to go on to some conclusion, which is that um you know a lot of work in the world as well is I think like um we mentioned sustainable, we'll still use the word, but we really got the path to find out and sustainable really if it's not the huge area that can find ways to work as communities to uh, be creative. And how we can use resources, how we can um, you know improve the planet that we're living on, give back to the ecosystem. Um, some of the things we've been focusing on are right more harvesting design, great water recycling systems. We just helped the design one in Costa Rica that was completed. Um, and and the one in uh, Costa Rica is saving them about 80% of the water right now. So uh, that's for an area of the water cost province. Um, you know, when we went to the jungle for places like in Brazil, we realized that, you know, we have water pumps. It doesn't really make sense to have a diesel generator or a gas generator because that's the water pump, you know, because you're just, it's more of that, of that issue. So um, now we have a permaculture design person on our team. We're doing that with the great water recycling system. So we use a lot of great water for the permaculture. 
And then we talk about the wood source and the and the alkaline infrastructure of water analysis. So um, that's pretty much it. And uh, I'll open up now to kind of answer questions and specifically here for my contact information or email or staff and my members of the Zoom groups. I've been very happy to join the Zoom group over the past um, yeah, month or two now. Um, and Oscar is sort of there as a uh, what was it called again? Uh, for you? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Tribalize. 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 <laughs> and that's where I met Francis also. And so that was a really beautiful place. And so, yeah, I um, spoke on a lot of the Bitcoin. I think that a lot of beautiful people and efforts that are coming together. And, um, you know, we've, we've been working for the nonprofit. We're also trying to expand reach now. So, yeah, we're excited. We're, even though there's a lot of challenges, we're excited about building more bigger. Um, yeah, if anyone has any specific questions, I'll take those now. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, um, I think it goes back to someone we were saying before about how development versus comfort. And um, I would say that, yeah, people can do use the smaller pools, for example, because um, the last pool we filled up was about 120,000 liters or so of water. It's a lot of water. But I would say rather than reducing the size of the pool, I would challenge or encourage developers or builders and people there to be able to reuse the water that they did look for. If you can get 80% of your water back from rain or from rainwater recycling or something that needs swimmable water, um, I think yeah. instead of pumping a bunch of new water out of the well, I would encourage people to look at ways that they can save water and or be able to put it back into the pool for things that aren't as hard for the aquifers, you know. Um, my sister lives in saltwater pool in Florida. Now there's a park going there that puts parks on water. I usually know so many pools because I don't like swimming. So if there's still in a pool, then I can go swimming. You know, but the ones, a lot of ones here don't have a lot of swimming. They don't have a ton of breakers. I would say yes, they could be small pools and also figure out ways to use the water better to get the bill. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like when you drain, for example, when you drain uh, coloring water or what have you, like a lot of times I have to ask them at my place there, like where do they put the water? And a lot of times they just pump it out into the jungle or swimming pool space, they put a lot of you know. But a lot of this has a lot of leachates in it, you know. Um, in the best case scenario, it could go to a second stage of treatment, you know, which could be like another set of either filtrations or what we've done now is we started putting like a, they have another holding tank there. And the holding tank, you can apply some of the enzymes, especially if there's more waste contaminants based in there. And, and the enzymes tend to break down a lot of the things. They do have some trouble with gasoline content and with chlorine content. Um, and chlorine, chlorine, the one what they've done before is they put it to another holding tank, then we pump it through another set of, of basically carbon filtration, which are like a large cell carbon filtration. That reduces 99% of the chlorine, and then it's going to go out. But yeah, it's definitely, I think, a lot of the second stage or third stage that could be needed after you know, breaking the yeah. uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, going back to the young, young market study uh -huh. and the perception of higher altitude water being more pure or the purest. Since 1945, humans have grown up over 22 atomic and hydrogen bombs underground, in the ocean, and in our atmosphere, in the magnetic field. Has anybody ever done any study how that affects, well, many things, but mostly water? 
Yeah, you know, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. I think that there was this one study I was reading that showed that um, a lot of the nuclear, that water had so many things in it that the ocean because of California in there was the Fukushima plant, for example, which is just a bunch of nuclear waste in the ocean. They were tracking it how far it went to California. And basically, they made an alert that you should stop eating salmon and so that fish because it's all radioactive at some point. And, um, you know, they did measure certain amounts of radioactivity. I would say that somehow water is super resilient also uh, because even there, after about six months per year, the levels started decreasing, which basically means that the ocean somehow was purifying even toxic material. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, like the earth, the element itself is able to so much purify. In the air, I think, from what I understand, um, a lot of the capsules of rainwater at higher altitudes are better because they don't hit into any of the layers of the industrial um, realm. And so the, the mountain just focuses the most natural rainwater. By the time it gets into the lower uh, stratospheres, it starts to pick up more of the, um, the level of the that would be in the lower atmospheres. But so that's I mean, a good point. Also, I would say that um, you know, to lower those amounts, the, the better it would be possible to obviously not have any more air pollution, but realistically, water has been able to clean itself up to a certain extent. You have a question? Does not have what? Sewer, sewer right, right. Short one, very fun one. What is the tip for all of us that are traveling 
what what kind of water shall we apply during our travels or will we stay to work or other things for two, three months? What is your tip for us? How can we get the best water? Yeah, I would say for um, if you don't have uh, like not gonna get a water filtration for being here for six months or a year or something. Yeah. Um, there's Agua Viva in town, which I have used myself quite a lot. And uh, they're at a foodie market. And where else can they get Agua Viva? Is there a website for it? Um, what's up? What's up? Yeah, so he helps me this company, Agua Viva. They have very good water, it's like 8.5 pH. Um, I, I find it really good. Them and um, Cloud Rain, uh, is also, they both have WhatsApp, they can deliver their phone to you. In the stores and there and and, and the oxygen stuff, they're starting to put this other one out that has a higher pH on it. Um, I forgot the name of it now though. So the pH is the most important part to check, and what is the number that should be there minimum eight eight is there? I say about eight is good, like anything <coughs> below seven is acidic okay. and seven is neutral. And you want slightly alkaline water, just a lot better for your system. So yeah, eight, eight point five is good, you know, for other areas. And, um, you know, when I was traveling, I would just travel with life straws to be able to have that. There's some little bottles there that you take out any chemicals in it. So, but yeah, there's some good waters on the market now that you can get without having to buy your own filtration system. Mm -hmm. So, I would, get his, I would get his contact with Boda. Uh, there we go. But thank you everyone for sticking around to the end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you, Karuna. Awesome talk. Uh, water, one of the main topics. Um, so tomorrow, if anyone's interested, we're going to be hosting a regenerative community day where we're going to go and meet the space that Karuna was speaking in uh, Chemiyu. Uh, we're going to show and meet this place, um, Paladora, and discuss how they want to become a regenerative community as well. What that looks like for them and their process to create all the structures for it and the human element. And then we're gonna have a social on how this regenerative movement is creating this new way of life um, that a lot of people connect with the term new earth, um, a new way of living that makes a positive impact instead of just taking from the world. So if you're interested tomorrow, uh, we'll share it in the Regen Tribe, uh, or sorry, in uh, the Regen Tulum chat, what's going on, where we can meet tomorrow and have more of like a social time to connect on these topics and how to implement them to changing our lifestyles. So thank you guys for coming again on Friday. Um, if you guys didn't check in on the QR code, it would be great if you did. Um, see now, we can send you the information for these events and future events. If you know if you guys didn't check in. And if you did, thank you and awesome to meet everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you.